Hello and welcome to Filling the Sink, a podcast from Catalan News. I'm Lorcan Doherty and today we're talking about gender-based violence. The 8th of March is International Women's Day, which, as well as celebrating the achievements of women, is also about taking action to drive gender parity and raising awareness of discrimination. In this podcast, we're focusing on one of the key issues, violence against women. Incidents reported to police in Catalonia jumped significantly last year, and there are several ongoing high-profile cases, including former Barca footballer Danny Alves. Coming up, we asked the Equality and Feminism Minister, Tania Berja, what the government is doing to tackle gender-based violence. Christina Tomas-White travels to a specialist intervention centre that helps women affected by sexist violence. We'll hear from the director and from one woman who suffered emotional abuse by her partner. Christina's here with me now. Hi, Christina. Hi, Larkin. How are you? Good, thank you. And we're joined by Gifre Jordan as well. Hello, Gifre. Hello. Hi, Larkin. So I thought we could start by asking, is the problem of violence against women getting any better? Do we have any evidence of that, Gifre? Well, uh, that's obviously tricky to say. It's difficult to say. What we can say is that uh, the figures say that police reports uh, regarding gender-based uh, violence are going up, actually, and not down. So in, in, in the first 10 months of 2022, there were 12,900 police reports, which is uh, 13% more than in uh, 2021, and it's the highest figure in 10 years. The figures also show that the area in Catalonia with the highest ratio of uh, such violence is Ciutat Bella, Barcelona's district of Ciutat Bella, the old town of Barcelona. This is the highest ratio of the whole of Catalonia. We did an article on Catalan News back in November looking at those figures. And the interesting thing is when I read them, OK, over the past decade, 10,000, 11,000 cases reported to the police. And now it's nearly 13,000. I don't know, it doesn't sound like a massive increase, but whenever you see the graph embedded into that article, you really see that it has really massively shut up after being steady for, for 10 years. So the question is, are incidents increasing or is reporting increasing, Christina? Well, obviously, this is a very hard question because it's just very hard to tell. There's a lot more awareness in the past few years, especially you know because of the Me Too movement and, and more people are reporting these crimes. But even when we look at the reports, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So um, the Catalan government survey that they did um, at the end of 2021, they asked 16,000 women over the age of 16 uh, whether they had suffered uh, any violence and how many of these reported it. And only 18.4% actually reported this. This means that, that there are way more women out there that aren't that aren't reporting this. Though if we do compare it to um, previous years, the trend is going up. So it's going up between 13 to 17%. So the fact that more people are going to the police, so more women are going to the police and saying, I'm a victim of gender-based violence, Counterintuitively, that might not be necessarily a bad thing because it might not mean cases are going up. It just means that people are, are reporting more. More aware of it. Exactly. That same survey that you mentioned, Christina, does make some pretty stark reading, though. 80% of women living in Catalonia have suffered some form of gender-based violence at some point in their lives. So four out of every five. And uh, the, the types of violence were, the main one was sexual violence, followed by psychological violence and also online violence. Though, though just to be clear, um, they're including like verbal harassment on the street as a form of sexual, sexual violence. Sexual violence. And a worrying trend is that woman who suffered some type of gender-based violence in 2021 was 26.2%, so over one in four. That's almost nine percentage points higher than in 2016 when they did a previous survey. I mean, a lot of statistics, but Gifre, as your Twitter profile says, numbers hide endless human stories. Does it say that? That's oh, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Didn't know, no. <laughs> but yeah, it's important, obviously, to hear uh, some specific stories. So, Christina, you travelled to Villanova y la Geltru, down along the coast mm -hmm. here from Barcelona, mm -hmm. to uh, a specialised intervention service, uh, SIE. Uh, tell us what that is. So it's a place that provides legal, psychological and, and other forms of counseling to women who have suffered um, not only at the hands of their partners, but it could also be someone who's been sexually abused by someone 
that they weren't in a relationship with, someone who may have suffered institutional violence uh, because of their gender, um, and not only the women, but their children too. Okay. There are 17 of these centres across Catalonia, with six more to open this year. Christina, you spoke to Susanna Conesa, the director of this centre, and one survivor of gender-based violence who called herself Tony. Let's take a listen. Doing an interview at a CIA is trickier than your average news piece. You need to try to make someone who's gone through a lot comfortable with opening up to you, a stranger, about some of the most awful things that have ever happened to them. And it's not only that. There's also a very palpable fear of, if I speak up, will my ex-partner come after me? It takes us a moment to get started. First, we have to come up with what our anonymous survivor's name will be. After tossing around a few ideas, we settle on Tony, which sounds nothing like her real name. Before we start the actual interview, Susanna asks Tony if she'd feel more comfortable changing her clothes. I've already assured them that we'll be filming her from behind, so only the back of her head and shoulders are visible in the video, and I tell them we'll be modifying her voice, but they're still scared her ex-partner will be able to recognize her. They come back a few minutes later, Tony donning a professional-looking blouse that the CIA has on site to loan women in need, and a scarf she drapes loosely over her head to hide her hair. We start talking. It takes her a minute or two to feel at ease, but she soon starts telling me her story. She first started going to the CIA a couple years ago after she told her family doctor at her primary care center that she'd been feeling a bit blue. They referred her to a psychologist, who then referred her to someone else, who then referred her to where we are now. She remembers the moment a psychologist told her that what her partner was doing was emotional abuse and how it came as a shock to her. Over time, she'd become desensitized, unable to recognize his behavior for what it was. There are things that we've normalized. Love is often associated with possession, jealousy, and control, Tony tells me. Tony still goes to the CIA for counseling. It was really difficult at first, she says. She'd get choked up and would leave feeling worse than when she first got there. But over time, she realized this was necessary for her to heal. Cecilia also provides Tony with legal assistance. She still has to share custody of her son with her abuser. Emotional abuse, she says, is much harder to prove before a judge than other forms of violence since it leaves no physical trace. That's why he was acquitted and that's why he still gets to see their child. Despite the continued trauma of having to hand over her son to him, Tony says she's doing much better than when she first walked through the doors of the CIA. Reach out to someone you trust if you need help, Tony says. You need to talk to other people to realize you're not crazy, you're not the problem, and that things can get better. By the time she stops talking, Susana is teary-eyed. I know just how far you've come, she tells Tony. Every woman has their own life story and their own baggage that will influence their healing process. And some will need more time than others, but there's always hope, Susana argues. Unfortunately, she says, there's still a lack of understanding when it comes to gender-based violence and sexist discrimination. It's part of the culture. It's everywhere. Thanks very much for that report, Christina, and thanks to Tony and to Susanna Conesa, the director. A big story in the news over the last few months, Gifre has been a new consent law that the Spanish government brought in. Exactly, yeah, and it's been a matter of discussion uh, for months because this this law that it's called uh, officially sexual freedom law uh, was approved. It's normally referred to as the only yes means yes law. Exactly, exactly. Solo CSC in Spanish, some people might have heard because it's always in the news for the past few months, so mm-hmm. ever since it was approved in August and came into force in autumn. So what's it all about? Well, uh, first of all, we need to know what the previous law uh, said, you know, the law uh, before 2022. So basically that law uh, distinguished two different scenarios, uh, what was legally called sexual aggression and, on the other hand, sexual abuse. So sexual aggression, according to that law, included violence, 
evidence of physical violence, right? While sexual abuse was a lesser offense. Was a lesser offense. There was lesser sentences, lower sentences, because there was no evidence of uh, physical violence. That, that's what the law said. Right. Very controversial. Yeah. Very controversial, yeah. especially controversial when we had this wolf pack uh, case in Pamplona, La mm. Manada case. You know, it was like a, a gang, gang rape. Gang case. rape. Yeah. Exactly. So it was a group of men who raped a woman. The initial sentence for this case was sexual abuse because there was no violence, physical violence found in the woman's body. Because she didn't fight back. Because she didn't fight back. She was paralyzed. You know, that's what she mm -hmm. argued. Like, <laughs> come on, uh, have you ever been found in this situation? Yeah, so she was, I was too scared. I was too scared. There were five guys, you know, um, in, in this situation. So, well, this uh, sentence was overruled. And in the end, the Spanish Supreme Court, if I'm not wrong, uh, accepted calling it sexual aggression. And the sentence uh, was increased from nine years in jail to 15. Okay, so this case was clear for the Spanish government and the Spanish lawmakers to decide, you know, a, a, a major change law. in the law, basically, right? That's what happened in 2022. What did they do? They got rid of the sexual abuse part and they started to consider everything sexual aggression. Hmm. Or sexual assault, you might or say. Or sexual well. assault. Now there's no longer distinction between violence or no violence found. Okay, so what, what was key about this law was that explicit consent has to be clear, right? Hence the nickname, only yes means yes. Exactly, and if there's no consent, it's going to be called sexual assault, and that's it, you know? But what happened? Since they uh, removed the sexual abuse, the range of sentences that you could get was broader, you know, so they included the old sexual abuse uh, scenario, right? So the, the, the whole range of sentences was broader. And those who had been convicted for sexual aggression, but for instance, not raping, asked for the lesser a part of the of the new range of sentences. So basically, you had lawyers coming and asking for exactly. lower sentences for their for their clients exactly. because of this change in the law. And, and it was a bit of a loophole. Exactly. And, and quite a few men actually have had their sentences lowered. Hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds. You know, hundreds across of, Spain. Across Spain, that's 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 true. Uh, it was a bit of a paradox, right? Yeah, so yeah. it was okay. Wasn't this law supposed to cover? more and uh, protect more the victim why are uh, sexual assaulters uh, getting uh, lesser sentences now and there's been big political fallout I've, like the catalan equality minister for example she says well we can come across biased rulings that the judges aren't always educated in these matters and the police as well but across the political spectrum in catalonia and spain we've heard, uh, had exactly. all sorts of responses and to sum it up the spanish government two parties are now uh, trying to amend this law again in order to avoid these loopholes and it's caused a bit of a rift between the the yeah, coalition partners and the socialists one. on the one hand that are that want to change it, and then Podemos on the other. Irene Montero, the Equality Minister of Spain, who says that it's maybe more the judges should not be as kind of what Tania Verge is saying. Mm -hmm. While the right wing parties say, no, we it's have to go back to the old fault. law, you know, <laughs> sexual abuse against uh, sexual uh, aggression. Also in the news has been the case of Dani Alves, a Brazilian footballer, former FC Barcelona player, who is currently in jail. Uh, there's an ongoing investigation. He's been accused of sexual assault. Yes. Um, last December, um, towards the very end of the year, he was accused of raping a young a woman in her early 20s at a nightclub in Barcelona. He's been on remand, in prison on remand since mid-January January, yeah. um, because it, he's been deemed a flight risk just because he, he, he's... The fact that he's Brazilian, I suppose. He's, and, and he has a lot, uh, of money. has a lot of money. And the evidence isn't looking too good for him. He's, um, as you may be aware, he's been changing his story. He's changed his story four or so times since last December. Um, Started off saying he didn't know this girl. Then he yeah, said, yes, he knew her, but nothing consensual. happened. Uh, yeah. yeah. And they've also determined that his DNA, they found um, semen inside of her body. That's an ongoing investigation. We're following that on Catalan News. Another major case here in Catalonia, maybe not quite so known abroad, is the case of Saul Gordillo. 
Exactly. He's a leading journalist in Catalonia, former director of uh, Catalonia Radio, public radio station, and of uh, the Catalan news agency, too. Uh, he's, he's very, uh, very famous. Very in this. well known figure, yeah. Exactly, yeah, very well known yeah. figure. And, well, you know, he's facing not one but two police reports from employees of a digital newspaper he was leading at the moment in December 2022, two years, two months ago. Yeah, he's since been fired. He's but. been fired now, right? So apparently there was some work Christmas dinner and two of the female employees uh, who were there reported uh, a sexual assault by Gordillo in the early hours of the morning in a nightclub. Yeah, this is also think, last December. Yeah, do you think it, with these cases, is it, could you say it's kind of like a Catalan Me Too movement that we see in that, or is that... In the past few years, we've yeah, seen... I think like it's a, been going on before, since before and then. Exactly, there was this Instituto del Teatro <laughs> case, this theatre school, a uh, very, very famous one, uh, revealed by the Ariara newspaper, in which... 100 or more uh, witnesses were pointing at especially one teacher who was a famous, a very well-known playwright in Catalonia, Joan Ullier, and they were saying that he, you know, there was some abuse of power mixed with uh, sexual abuse or, you know, if you go to my home tonight, uh, I'm going to... You might get the role. Exactly, exactly, exactly this and, sort of thing. But in terms of court cases and, and things like that, well, John Ollier has actually since passed away. We're going to hear now from Catalonia's equality minister, Tanya Vergia. Actually, the first Catalan equality and feminism minister. There wasn't a, a, a dedicated department before, so that I guess that shows how things are changing. She actually tweeted after the Alves and Gordillo cases came out, a little bit controversially. Uh, we asked her about that. But first, uh, Christina, who went to speak to her, asked how the government is addressing the issue of sexual violence. We have actions that target the whole population with institutional campaigns, but also actions that target, for example, young people as well as elderly people, because we tend to think that sexual violence only uh, happens to, to young women, but there are also uh, older women that also suffer it, and they also need to know which are the services that are available to them. We are reinforcing the network of services, specialising the psychologists and the legal counsellors in sexual violence and we plan to open a new service by the end of this year. It consists of a face-to-face -face psychological emergency care with the capacity to reach the women's place in a very short period of time. We are currently drafting a specific program on masculinities to make them aware of how patriarchy also affects their daily life, the roles, the expectations that have also been imposed on men and the damage this is also doing to their own uh, well-being, as well as how to, we need to collectively prevent gender-based violence. What should be done in schools? Yeah, we are working with the Department of Education to implement sexual education at all educational levels at the youngest uh, stages. It's about the prevention of sexual violence, then it's about uh, giving uh, students tools, knowledge about what does it mean to have healthy, respectful relationships based on consent. There is a, a rising fundamentalist groups throughout Europe and throughout the world, right? But these groups are not going to shape, are not going to condition the, the political agenda. They seek to manipulate uh, sexual education as a form of perversion, while it is a form of prevention of violence. It is a tool to help uh, everyone establish healthy relationships. How is our understanding of this issue changing? Historically, there's been empathy for perpetrators and women's voice and experiences have been put into question. And we are seeing rapid change in this regard uh, since the Me Too global movement. Increasing social awareness, better accompanying to the victims, this is going to help 
to see in the forthcoming years a higher number of reports without this necessarily meaning that the number of rapes or the number of uh, sexual aggressions increases. It's because we need to overturn this uh, still very high number of underreporting. Do you think the criticism you received for tweeting about the Alves and Gordillo cases was fair? Well, I think that calling out sexual violence for what it is, that it is about power, it is not about sex, um, it's not interfering with the presumption of innocence. Not me, not any uh, member of the department has publicly commented on the specific case, has made no assessment on any of the suspects here. When we tweet this support, uh, we put the emphasis on there's a network of services, right? So they can um, provide the psychological support, uh, legal counsel, if you don't have it. And, and this, this is our role. That was the Catalan Equality Minister, Tania Verge. Our thanks to her for speaking to us. Despite the work that her department is doing, Christina, there have been some complaints from people who work with women who face gender-based violence. Uh, yeah, there have been. Um, actually, recently here in Barcelona, there was uh, what's known as the SADA, one of these centres that provides specialized counseling to women in the situation. They were going to go on strike because of a lack of, or what they say is a lack of resources and and they complain that they're they're overworked and underfunded though to be fair this is a council funded um center it's not the catalan government one of the reasons we're doing this podcast right now is because international women's day is the 8th of march and here in catalonia it's a big deal you know i think we've talked about it other years as well but there's huge protests in Barcelona and in other cities. A huge strike too. We'll be covering that on catalannews.com. Everyone goes and wears purple. Yeah. So maybe the... not me. I won't be covering it. <laughs> you may be on strike. You may, may or not be on strike. Um, Christina, tell us it's very important, I suppose, to let people know about the resources that they can access as well. So, you know, if you are a woman in Catalonia, there's a hotline, for example. Yeah, no, first and foremost, there's this hotline. It's 24-7 and in 40 different languages. It's 900-900-120. And there'll be no record of it on your phone bill if you do call. Um, if you If you do need help and you call this number, they'll be able to tell you where to go. But um, very briefly, just to summarize this, there are the specialized centers, like the one that I went to in Vilanova. These are the SIEs, S-I-E's. And then there are also the SIADs, which are more information desks. Well, not desks, but um, where, where you go for information um, of where to go afterwards. Um, though they are, they do have different names in Barcelona. So you have the PIAD for the information and the SADA, which is the center that I was talking about earlier, where the workers almost went on strike, but then they called it off last minute. Okay, lots of different acronyms. The hotline, 900-900-120 will guide you to whichever is suitable for you. And uh, the Catalan government said, Tanya Verge, the minister, told us that uh, the Catalan government services care for 37,000 workers women and their children each year as well. And you don't need to, you know, have gone to the police in order to get resources or access to services. Time now for our Catalan phrase. You've got one this week, Christina? Mm-hmm. Uh, fins als ovaris, o està fins als ovaris. Fins al ovaris, which I think means, well, literally, <laughs> up until, to my, up, yeah, up to my up ovaries. To my ovaries uh, to, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I guess traditionally we would speak of male genitalia and... Um, I stick fins als collons. That would be like the a, male version, traditional version, but like we're just adapting, you yeah, know, to... Yeah. And now people say yeah, fins al ovaries. feminist over the years. <laughs> so whenever you're frustrated, if, if you're like, oh, I've had, I've had it, you know, you say, I've had it up to my uh, I've had to it up ov- to here, you yeah, say. up to my ovaries. <laughs> Fins <laughs> also baris. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you very much for listening. Do subscribe to Filling the Sink wherever you get your podcasts if you've not done that already. Thanks very much to everyone who spoke to us this week. Thanks very much, Christina and Gifre. Pleasure. We'll be back again next Saturday with another episode of Filling the Sink. Until then, from me, Lorcan Doherty, and all of us here at Catalan News. Bye for now. Adeu.